Hello and welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Matthew Lesh and I'm the Head of Research at the Adam Smith Institute. I'm very excited to be joined by two fantastic speakers tonight, uh, Zion uh, as well as Christopher. Uh, but before we get into that, um, I just wanted to give a little bit of an introduction about, about this topic, um, which of course is the environment. So we're gonna be discussing the really something that I think free marketeers have struggled with for a long time, which is how we can contribute to environmental debates. Um, I think often free marketeers have vacated the space, often denied the legitimacy of the problems that are being raised, um, and in some cases scared away for good reasons. Often environmental politics has been dominated by those who see little role for markets, uh, those who see uh, environmentalism as a thinly disguised tool for advocating far left economic and social policies, and at worst uh, labeled the kind of watermelon phenomenon, the, the green on the outside, hiding red on the inside. Um, that's why I was very excited when Chris last year, Christopher Bernard, who's, who's on this webinar, uh, invited me to contribute to a book that he was co-editing is now being released called Green Market Revolution um, on the topic of market environmentalism. And really for me, kind of summed it up as market environmentalists seek to harness the ingenuity of humankind to address challenges we face. Uh, it's an optimistic form of environmentalism that kind of re rejects the, the doomsday defeatism that can often dominate much of the debate that has led to one in five British school children saying that they have anxiety about climate change, uh, that sees really this constant dialogue about lack of action, lack of solutions, and just everything going terribly wrong. Uh, instead of kind of widespread brands, uh, bans or, or really central control, market environmentalists seek to use decentralized decision making, so markets, prices, property rights, um, to improve the world. And that means in the first instance, letting markets do what they do best, ensuring the efficient use of scarce resources. Uh, we live in a world of finite things. Um, the challenge is always to use those in the best possible way. Uh, free markets often have proven, and really not often, but in every case proven uh, far more productive if you just compared uh, the amount of resources used in the Soviet Union to produce uh, the same level of economic output or the same car, you're talking one, two, three, four times as much inputs. And of course, if you're using more inputs, you're um, leaving the environment worse off. You're also inevitably uh, committing more pollution as well as um, more carbon emissions that contribute to something like climate change. Uh, free markets incentivize people to use more resources, uh, so to use less resources to produce more. Um, and despite what many have been led to believe, in fact, the UK reached peak stuff around 2001. Uh, since then, we'll be using fewer physical resources in both absolute and per capita terms to produce more goods and services. And this kind of innovation, this kind of entrepreneurialism, which has led us to this point, means that we're putting less pressure on the environment, um, as well as improving our quality of life. And I think that's really the environmental goal for free marketeers is to say, rather than how can we degrowth or how can we stop consuming or how can we stop traveling or how can we stop doing what we're currently doing, either really the challenge is to do what we're currently doing, but do it with a less of an impact on the environment. The second part of market environmentalism is really about seeing how we can more efficiently allocate property rights so that limited resources are put to their best possible use. And we don't overly use the, the natural environment in the traditional tragedy of the commons, where if you put a field in the commons and you allow farmers to let's say graze it with um, cows, they're gonna inevitably overgraze. There's no incentive for them to individually um, make sure they use it too much. But if, if that is in ownership, then they do have an incentive to ensure it's continued security over time. A good example of this was in the 1980s when New Zealand government adopted a quota management system that set a limit of how much each fish stock could be used. And they allocated the fisheries, um, so fishermen, uh, individual transferable quotas, the ITQ system, which could be bought, sold, and leased in the same way as traditional property, giving each owner the right to catch a specified quantity. This, along with other market enabling reforms over the decades, enabled the rebuilding of previously depleted inshore fisheries and ensure that catches are limited to levels that can be sustained to so the country's economic benefit. And if this model has proven extremely successful across the world in terms of ensuring secure fish supplies and, and ensuring a kind of scientifically driven, but also market driven approach. Tonight, we're gonna to be hopefully responding to some of the, the doom and gloom out there about the environment by discussing a, an optimistic, progressive and, and science driven form of environmental, environmentalism that seeks to use um, 
tools that we have and embrace technologies that we can use to try to combat environmental issues. Um, our first speaker today, as I've mentioned Chris already a few times, Christopher Bernard, who's the president and founder of the British Conservation Alliance. He's also the co-editor of Green Market Revolution, a fantastic book with a fantastic chapter by, by yours truly, if I say so myself, um, which this full title is Green Market Revolution, How Market Environmentalism Can Protect Nature and Save the World. So Chris is going to be speaking first this evening. Um, he is going to be discussing uh, his approach to the environment, why he founded the BCA, um, and, and what kind of market environmentalists can bring to the debate. Awesome, thank you very much, Matt. And, and I think that's really uh, an excellent uh, introduction to the topic. Um, and I would like to start by pointing out how um, spot on I thought the email description for the event was, because indeed very often the debate surrounding climate change is about political revolution. I mean, we have a, a former Extinction Rebellion spokesperson on the panel here, so I don't pretend to have the same knowledge she does about the organization, but one of the founders of Extinction Rebellion explicitly stated uh, the movement is actually about dismantling capitalism. Uh, on, on a more subtle note, uh, the Green New Deal in America, uh, designed by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, talks about universal healthcare, universal housing, federal job guarantees, and so forth. Uh, and you quickly realize, hang on, this isn't an environmental platform. It's a left-wing wish list. It's a much wider political, social, and economic agenda that uses climate change as some kind of Trojan horse for all kinds of other kind of political um, uh, wish lists. Uh, and I mean, if you even read the Green New Deal document, it's only 14 pages long. For every one reference that it contains to the planet, you have 10 references to social justice, government programs, economic reforms, etc. So yes, I mean, it's, it's spot on to say that actually when we talk about uh, a lot of the environmentalism nowadays, you're talking about uh, a political revolution, people wanting to engender a political revolution. And, and the problem is that the tactics that have been used to propel this are pretty problematic to say the least. Uh, firstly, I'm sure many of you are aware of the manner in which this kind of environmentalism has completely dominated the political debate. Uh, in recent years, there's been some kind of implicit assumption that to be green requires you to lean left or even socialist. Uh, and in doing so, the environmental movement has effectively ostracized conservatives and libertarians and classical liberals and created an intense partisan polarization around this topic. Um, and, and by kind of tacking on all kinds of social and economic criteria to an environmental platform, they've paradoxically gridlocked much climate action. Uh, the second problem is that the, the narrative to achieve this political domination has very often been alarmist and, dare I say, apocalyptic. Um, I would like to preface this by saying that climate change is a big and urgent threat, but it's also dishonest to claim that billions of people will die within 12 years because of it. Uh, and scare tactics, have, scare tactics have largely been used to promote this radical political agenda uh, and push for completely unrealistic net zero targets, such as 2030, which would effectively realize their, their dream of dismantling the current economy that we have, the market-based economy. Um, psychological research actually shows that this approach is also unsustainable in the long run. Uh, it's, very, it's unhelpful. Uh, Steven Pinker of Harvard University, for example, shows that people are more likely to embrace climate action and be willing to personally contribute to it if they are told that real solutions and optimistic innovations exist. Uh, scaremongering actually makes people more likely to reject climate action uh, or even the belief that climate change is happening. So in a paradoxical way, uh, many of these uh, scaremongers are, are shooting themselves in the foot. So what we need as the name of the webinar suggests is a new approach uh, based on innovation, based on optimism and also based on honesty. Uh, and, and Matt said I would talk a tiny bit about my organization. And this is one of the reasons why I founded uh, the British Conservation Alliance less than a year ago. Um, and it's now the largest environmental campus network in the UK at over 30 universities across the country. And we mainly promote market-based and free enterprise solutions to environmental problems. And, and it's been amazing to see us really capture that long lost share 
of young right-leaning people who do care about these issues, contrary to what the current debate would suggest. Um, and the appetite for market-based pro-innovation, pro-property rights solutions is increasing every day. Um, and, and so we've already seen massive growth in this area. Uh, we're seeing conservative and libertarian think tanks around the world embrace this topic. Um, as Matt mentioned, we recently published a book called Green Market Revolution, which was a collaboration on this topic between 21 authors from 15 organizations in five countries around the world. Uh, Daniel Hannon wrote the foreword. Matt himself, as he said, wrote chapter five, um, which you definitely should check out. Um, so apologies for the same the shameless self plug here, but do check it out if you're interested because many of the ideas we'll be talking about today are present in the book. Um, you can get a free copy. Uh, you can download a free copy at greenmarketrevolution.eco. Um, but anyway, so that's my intro, uh, kind of just a few minutes to to talk about uh, the general perspective that I have, why the BCA was founded, um, and yeah, I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Chris, yeah, so I'm just wondering, uh, before we before we move on uh, to Zion's introduction, why you think the environmental movement has taken traditionally quite a, I suppose, a pessimistic line? Um, do you think it's in a, in a sense, a very heartfelt, but kind of a misguided political strategy, or is there something more pernicious about it? What, what, what do you think has driven that? And do you find people are kind of more responsive if you, again, as, as Stephen Pinker, you know, kind of research you're referring to, um, when you do present those solutions on campus, so you can get kind of a broader spectrum of people interested in environmental issues? Yeah, I do think you need to separate between the people that kind of, the brains behind the operation, and, and the people that are kind of protesting in the streets that genuinely do care. I mean, I, I even people within BCA, they've said like, my parents went to Extinction Rebellion marches because they felt it was the only place, the only outlet for their genuinely felt emotions about the environment and, and their frustration that nothing's happening. So I, I, wouldn't, dis, I wouldn't ascribe any malice to those people. Um, I think the perniciousness sinks in when you look at the kind of intentions be behind these, these movements um, and, and often they, the way they approach it is really to suit their, their wider agenda. So the fact that Exchange Rebellion had this kind of anti-capitalist slant to start with, or the fact that, um, uh, for example, the Sunrise Movement and the Sierra Club in America explicitly campaigned um, for higher regulations on nuclear energy because it suits them and it suits their kind of agenda because nuclear is very efficient and it, and it doesn't work with their kind of idea that uh, we need to overthrow economic growth in order to tackle climate change. Um, so, so I do think that there is um, this separation between the two people, uh, and I would I would say that there is kind of this underlying wider political agenda that's driven much of the the view on the environmental debate nowadays. I just at this point uh, bring in uh, Zion Lights, who is our next speaker. Uh, she's the UK Director of Environmental Progress and a nuclear energy advocate. Uh, she's a former spokesman for Extinction Rebellion, a founder of climate reporting newspaper The Hourglass and author of The Ultimate Guide to Green Parenting. Uh, Zion first came to many people's attention during her time with Extinction Rebellion, including a now perhaps infamous interview with Andrew Neil, um, in which uh, Andrew put to Zion a, a bunch of questions about some of the most extreme claims made by other Extinction Rebellion advocates, activists, um, like claims about billions of people are about to die, as well as what the solutions would be. Um, but a few weeks ago in, in late June, uh, in an opinion piece, Zion came out as a nuclear energy advocate, something which I imagine was extremely difficult to do considering uh, her current, uh, so her previous circle of friends. Um, and saying that she'd been duped into an anti-science sentiment all this time. Uh, so, Zian, I was wondering if you could start, run us through your kind of changing worldview and, and what drove that uh, after the interview and, and why you're so passionate now about nuclear energy. Thanks, Matthew. Um, so, I was always interested in science. I was always interested in finding out, you know, what the solutions were to different problems. That was kind of something that I had in the background, part of the person that I am. Um, and I have also always been in, interested in the environment and I learned about global warming when I was at school and I was quite worried about it. And I did research into it and thought, you know, these are manageable problems. 
um, we can we can fix all of this. And then over the years started to think we're not really doing anything to fix this or nothing substantial. So um, I then had a daughter and when I had my daughter, I came across all kinds of different opinions. Um, a lot of the myths about how to raise her, th just even just things like how to get her to sleep or what should I feed her. Um, and it was quite overwhelming, actually. And I just wanted to know, um, you know, what, what does evidence tell us is the best thing to do? And I started researching it and found that there's masses of research out there. And some things, you know, as with a lot of science, and there's not a really clear solution, but a lot of things, it, it's really easy to just to just look it up and find it. And I read hundreds of studies and I had so much interest from people asking me to write about it or to talk to them about it so that they could raise their children in a, a evidence based way um, that I ended up writing a book about it, which is called The Ultimate Guide to Green Parenting. And this is my first experience of kind of coming out for something. And I didn't really know I was doing it because the book had a chapter on vaccines. And I did know that it was a little bit of a controversial topic in the green parenting movement. I did know that. But the the response, the response that I had was just um, if you're not prepared for that kind of response, then it's um, really quite unpleasant that people would say, you know, oh, I really like all the chapters in your book. I like the chapter on how we should, you know, we can reduce um, our carbon footprint through transport or through diet. But I don't like that chapter on vaccines. Who's paying you to write that? Are you paid by big pharma? All kinds of I had all kinds of things thrown at me. Um, and I thought that was interesting because my response was always with well, the research that informs that chapter is absolutely the same as the research that informs all the other chapters. It's the same scientific method. You know, what, what's really going on here? Um, so, yeah, so um, then I, I realized over time that actually it's not just the environmental movement either. There's a lot of this pseudoscience around. There's a lot of people just believe all kinds of myths and sometimes it's harmless and it's fine and sometimes you know, it's having a huge impact on the world and the way that we live. And so I went back to university and I did a master's in science communication. How do we to learn? How do we actually talk to people about research? And, you know, how, how do we actually solve some of these really solvable problems? Um, so I did the, the master's. I went back into communicating about climate change. I found that people generally weren't interested that I'd bring up the topic and it was just people were kind of bored. Um, I'd be invited to talk at events about climate change and start, you know, I'd have a presentation and start talking. People would just want to know, oh, you know, tell us about how you lower your carbon footprint. And I felt, well, well that's not enough. And, I, and although I might have quite a low one, I don't really expect everybody to live that way. You know, I don't drive, for example. Um, but I, I, I recognize that it's very difficult, especially once you have children, not to drive. So um, I don't really see that as a solution. So. Then I got was asked to speak to be a spokesperson with Extinction Rebellion. It seemed like a really good opportunity. They were making waves. Um, worked with some incredible people there. You know, was really um, kind of welcomed into that movement. But then, um, yeah, I found the same thing where I was trying, still trying to communicate science at a really basic level. And um, you know, it happened straight away as a spokesperson because of things like you know, net zero by 2025, that's not evidence-based, but they, they know that that's not evidence-based. But then when I was put on the spotlight, it became very difficult for me to defend it. Um, and then, as you said, um, you know, then I went on the Andrew Neil show and he said, you don't have any solutions. And I found that really frustrating because I spent my life studying um, solutions and I couldn't, as a spokesperson for that organization, I didn't feel that I could just you know, come out and say what I thought the solutions were. So I thought actually Extinction Rebellion done a really good job at getting climate on the agenda because before it was really difficult for me to talk about. And now it's it's easy and everybody wants to hear about it. Um, you know, and I know you might say, well, that's because people are afraid and that's not right. And I, I appreciate that that's, part, you know, big part of the argument here. But for me, it was kind of, well, this is good. Now we can move in the direction of solutions. But, you know, I just found that in that organization, I couldn't because... Um, ultimately, their solution is their third demand, which is that they want, um, yes, this political overhaul where citizens assemblies would decide, um, you know, how, how we move forward in all of these areas and, and, and inform policy by listening to scientists, which actually I think, you know, in some ways is a really beautiful idea, but it's very idealistic. And I don't, I don't, not only do I not see it happening, but I don't see it happening on a timeline where it's actually going to help us bring down emissions and deal with the issues that we, you know, we have to hand and we actually we have so many experts that we can appeal to I kind of think why don't we just go directly to them and um yeah so then um 
Michael Schellenberger, um, who runs Environmental Progress USA, he's the president and founder, um, he wrote a quite damning article about me, as many people did after the Andrew Neil show. And um, I was interested in it because he said, you know, uh, he said he said things that I, you know, I kind of agreed with. And some of it I thought, well, that I'm being misinterpreted there. So I sent him a message and I said, you know, actually what I was trying to say here is this. And he said, well, do you want to talk? And we had this this discussion and he said, I'm going to record this interview. I'm going maybe going to use some of this content in my book. Um, and that book is out now. Um, and, you know, he really grilled me in that interview. But actually, I think he found that I was just in this organization trying to do a good thing. And I would say that there are a lot of people in in Extinct Rebellion who are absolutely trying to do that. There's lots of scientists in there who are kind of trying to do that. So, um, you know, and it offers them a platform, but then at the same time you get put on this, you know, you get you get tarred with the same brush in a same in in a, in a way. Um, and so we had this discussion and I just said to him, you know, it was quite heated. And I just said at some point, you know what, I looked up your TED talk on nuclear power and I already completely agree with that. And, you know, for him, it was like a real moment of kind of what, what did you say? Um, and I said, well, actually, this happened years ago, years ago that I shifted my opinion. Um, and it was because I had, you know, a friend of mine had sent me a paper on radiation. I had been told by um, different environmentalists, this was well before Extinction Rebellion, different um, environmental organizations that all these exponential numbers of deaths and illnesses had occurred due to radiation poisoning from nuclear power. And actually, when I saw this paper, pure research, pure data it wasn't the case. The numbers were so low that I was shocked and I completely changed my mind. And I shared that paper with people and found that I lost friends. Um, so um, found that actually, you know, this is not a discussion that people are ready to have. And I um, kept quiet about it until Mike rang me and then about a month ago, completely out of the blue, hadn't spoken to him since that initial interview. And he said, you know, would, would you come, would you come out as pro nuclear, you know, because I'm looking for someone to, to take over this kind of UK base of EP um, to, to launch it, you know, would you do that? Um, and, you know, he, he, he rang me every day for a few days and said, because I said, yes, he said, are you sure? Are you really sure? Because it's going to be tough and you're going people will turn against you and you know you and I said I absolutely am ready to advocate for solutions and I think that nuclear is one of the more difficult areas because there are all these myths and so much fear surrounding things like radiation that absolutely I'll do it and so that's that's a position I'm in now and I kind of launched that with that city AM article where I said this is why I'm coming out and inviting you know it's inviting other environmentalists to come forward and, and embrace nuclear power. Well, thank you very much. That's uh, quite a fascinating introduction. I assume you were you were pro-vaccinating children, and that's why some of the yeah, it's quite a frightening thought, isn't it? I'm just wondering before we get onto some of the more substantive uh, matters, which um, we're keen to tackle. I'm just wondering kind of what effects that had on you personally as as flipping your political position. I think politics can often be quite tribal, and if you have some heterodox opinions for people in your tribe and who your friends are that can be quite alienating so I was wondering what what you found and have you managed to persuade a lot of people of your perspective or have you just kind of lost a lot of friends along the way I think tribalism pervades everything not just politics um, and it's very difficult to step out of and I completely don't ascribe to any and you know any specific dogma and what I would say is that makes me kind of an outlier and I think that evolutionarily it makes sense that people form these bonds that are based on these opinions because that's your you know your tribe and you used to need that to survive and being ostracized would mean that you wouldn't survive so I completely understand that and that's not mm. something that I really care about which is why I, it's more important to me that we tell the truth um, and that's why you know I kind of came out accidentally as pro-vaccination and had uh, had a really awful time I have to say really awful much much worse than now at the time I had uh, some really angry people really angry thinking that I was pushing some big pharma agenda it was incredible really um, and then now, now with nuclear, now the interesting thing is that I actually expected that, was prepared for that. And it hasn't really happened in that degree. Yes, I've had some insults and I've had some of the, the mean emails, of course I have, but actually I've had more support than um, I would have guessed. And, and that's from people on both sides of the political spectrum. And if you look at that letter that I just wrote, um, that was published um, you know, to the British gov government asking them to build size well and more side, it's signed by by lefty activists and right wing thinkers. It's signed by you know some incredible scientists. It's signed by Stephen Pinker. It's signed by James Hansen. So there is space for people to come together on this issue and not just be um, 
you know, sink into their politics and just decide that they that that's just what they believe and that they won't be open minded about it. And, and I think that's um, a really important um, point that we've got to because it's kind of now or never with nuclear, you know, it takes a while to build, we need to be investing in it, building it now. So um, I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that um, a lot more comes out of this and in, in this role that I've taken. You said uh, during your remarks few minutes ago that uh, they know it's not evidence-based in relation to the, the 2025 target, which I think is quite interesting. Uh, in terms of, did, is it kind of a gambit claim? Is it something that, oh, we talk about a 2025 target just because we want to push the government further, even though to some people that might sound unachievable and it, in, and, and too costly and, and not worthwhile? Is this something that Extinction Rebellion puts forward because they need to put forward something quite extreme to kind of justify their existence? Like what's the kind of strategic thinking if it's something that people accept might not necessarily be scientifically based or is that perhaps an exaggeration and some people do think it is scientifically based? No, I would say nobody would claim that it's scientifically based. Um, therefore, I never made the argument that, it, that evidence was on our side with that target. There are a couple of different reasons. One is the precautionary principle that they say it's better to act now than to leave it later. One is because they say if we leave it later, then politicians won't act now because you know they'll, they'll sign the agreements, but they don't actually have to do the work and they'll leave it to people later on. And that will then will risk miss, missing targets. Um, and another reason is a social justice issue that they think well, other nations, other countries need to develop. And so their emissions will go up. Therefore, we should actually aim for a lower um, target. So they have they have thought it out. And it's kind of it is something where there's a lot of discussion going around it. To me, it kind of didn't matter what the year was. I just think we need to focus on just doing it anyway. And, it you know, putting a deadline on it seems a bit silly. But I, I understand that actually that that target created generated so much discussion that in a way it was, it was helpful. Just before we bring Christopher back in, I just want to dive a little bit deeper into some of the, the questions about nuclear. So I'm going to throw, uh, we can go one by one in terms of the criticism of, of nuclear. Um, so how many people died at Fukushima and Chernobyl? Was, were these huge disasters? Is, is it deadly? How does nuclear energy compare to renewable energy or fossil fuel energy in terms of its threat to life? It's lots of questions. Um, so Sorry. Fukushima, nobody died from radiation not one person actually years and years later somebody claimed that their cancer was caused by it and the government paid them money but the statistics show that they that it was more likely that they didn't get that from, from Fukushima the 500 and I think 75 people that did die from Fukushima was from the evacuation process because there was some panic and it was not from radiation that's really important that people understand that for context the tsunami itself killed over 15,000 people now, Chernobyl, Chernobyl does have a higher death toll. There were more people who contracted um, cancers, but actually it was thyroid cancer, which was really easily treatable. And it's still, you know, it was still, I can't remember the exact numbers, but they were low. What I would say about Chernobyl is it was a different scenario to Fukushima because the Soviet Union didn't tell people it had happened for weeks. So they stayed in that area. If they had been evacuated, there still would have been no deaths. You know, the actual blast killed 12 people. Now, if you look at that compared to all other energy production types, so all renewables, fossil fuel extraction, the death tolls are much higher. And that's really important that people go away and look at that. You can look at somewhere like ourworldindata.com. It's got really good numbers on there. That's not just my opinion. That Actually, the death, if you look at the deaths and the illnesses from all different kinds of energy generation, it's lowest in nuclear. That's where there's this real conspiracy against it. That people fear all of these things that aren't true. And, and, and if you look at fossil fuels in particular, the, just just the air pollution alone kills millions. That's not even comparable to the numbers I've just told you about from, from nuclear power generation. Yeah, just a quick point to tack onto that as well. Um, to put it starkly, in America, more people die every year from falling off the roof while insta installing a solar panel than from nuclear in the last 60 years. So I think that kind of just puts us starkly how safe nuclear actually is and how how important it is to remain evidence-based and science-based when we look at these things because i mean it's so important and and we're talking about an issue that's so crucial so why would we not follow the science so another uh and i'll put this back to you Zion, um another claim about nuclear is that it's now too expensive i think um ironically greta, greta Thunberg, who obviously wants net zero emissions worldwide by 2025 suddenly starts talking about the cost of nuclear as it being more expensive than renewable energy um is that true to say uh, is is renewable energy now cheap enough? And is it so? As then, is nuclear energy good enough? Is it reliable enough? Consistent enough? Is battery technology good enough? 
nuclear energy has always been reliable enough. Um, the problem that happened with, at Chernobyl was due to um, people who didn't follow safety regulations, which now, and actually nuclear used to take half the amount of time to build. And now the reason it takes about 10 to 12 years is because they've added so many regulations. Some of them may be not even necessary according to a lot of engineers. Um, but what I would say, I mean, I don't understand how anybody can say we can get to net zero without nuclear power. I just don't think that's feasible. But again, you know, I urge people to go away and look up the numbers, not, not at some, you know, uh, politically aligned website. Like look at the actual data, look at the numbers. Um, you can look at the IPCC report, right? The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They produced a 1.5 warming report, it's called. It came out in 2018, autumn. And there's a whole section on energy. It's not opinion, it's just data. And they say we need combination of nuclear renewables and carbon capture storage but if you look at the data it's just numbers it's not opinion it's just numbers we cannot meet the, our needs our energy needs we cannot keep our homes warm and our hospitals running without nuclear we just can't it's it's completely unfathomable at this stage and and we should really embrace the technology we have and i hear a lot of talk about well we can have this advanced technology and that's great let's put money into that but that that's not ready to build right now we have perfectly good plants right now that provide so much energy. For example, Fessenheim in, in um, France was just closed. That was closed because of political reasons, because of pressure from people who are afraid of the technology. That plant has never had an issue. It ran for 50 years. These plants can run for 80 years. That's so much energy. How can that, if you think about how much cost you put into it. So, so here's an example. So Sizewell, they're saying will cost 20 billion, right? But 80 years of energy that, you know, <laughs> How do you even compare that to solar panels or wind turbines, which simply, we know they don't last that long. I think solar, the last thing I saw was maybe up to 20 years. And then there's a real problem with being able to recycle them and what, you know, what's left over is, I know people worry about nuclear waste, but it's very well managed. It's very minimal. It's very safe the way it's done. We don't have that solution for turbines and panels that end up on landfill sites, you know. Um, but, but if you compare, to your other question, if we co you compare energy generation from solar or um, or any of the renewable options to nuclear, they just completely fall short. Um, the, you, you know, the, the cost, the cost of what um, goes into them, um, into both, if, if, you, if you look at um, how much money is put into both and then the energy generation, you know, it's, it's, it's so min minimal what you get from renewables. And that's actually something that I used to believe. I used to say, we can run the world on 100% renewables because it's what everybody around me said. People would share all kinds of reports and things with me. And I believe them when I looked at the actual data, actual data, and I spoke to actual engineers, that's actually, it's not true that, yes, it's cheap. It's cheap, to, it's cheap to put this many solar panels on this many houses, but they, that's just supporting those few houses who's going to who's going to support all the other buildings in this area it's not that same cost um could go to nuclear power which will support all of the buildings in the area and that's what we're looking at really unless you go into this de degrowth argument which is what a lot of people then do in response to this and say well we need to reduce consumption well we've tried to re reduce consumption but for years and and it's never worked it's never sufficient in fact it, energy consumption goes up all the time because population is increasing and people you know there's more people on the planet it's that simple uh, unless you want to force people to do it which i think is absolutely wrong um that those numbers are not coming down so we cannot meet the needs with the existing renewable tech i make a slightly more interesting point there which is that energy consumption uh globally is going up as countries develop but in the most developed countries energy consumption in some ways can be going down so for example with cars are more efficient you can have um reduced energy consumption over time but i think you're fundamentally right that if we want to reach the targets we're going to need to provide the amount of energy we have today from from new sources and if we're going to continue growing our economy but this conversation is kind of largely premised on the idea that the climate change is a threat and we have a um a question from from graeme smith about people on the other side of the debate to this to the the uh climate um environmentalist movement and he's asked, I'd largely agree with your analysis of hidden left agenda of, of much of the environmental movement, but equally climate change now is a major obstacle to real environmental progress and appears to be a right-wing prerogative. How do you distance yourself from such a denial and do you actively counter such positioning? Um, and before I go to Chris, I'll say that this is some of the response we got to this webinar, just the fact that we're talking about the environment. Uh, ironically, um, I got an email from someone I won't name who sent me an, an email by, uh, sorry, sent me a, an article by um, Michael um, Schellenberg, who, who's uh, Zion's um, head in, of in the UK, his organization. So I thought it was quite ironic that 
um, we, we're having somebody from his organization and we're still being sent him as a contrary opinion. But Christopher, how do we respond on the other side of politics, those who don't think climate change is a real issue? Yeah, I think, I think that's something that's very important to emphasize. And that's something that we talk about extensively in the book as well, is that as much as, as we see the left has dominated the environmental debate, we've also seen that the right has to take responsibility for shunning the debate. And that, that the right, be it kind of the libertarian right or conservatives or classical liberals, kind of anywhere of any of the above, they basically um, seen these, this, these environmental discussions go in the direction they have been, like Green New Deal type um, socialist ideas. And the problem has been that because of that, they've conflated environmental action with these kind of big government economic control ideas. Um, and so, so it's, it's very important to, to emphasize that, that those people on, on the kind of more right wing side of the spectrum have to take responsibility for kind of oscillating uh, towards climate denialism simply because they don't like the solutions being offered. Um, so, and that has been a major hurdle. So, so to me, it's very positive that we're having these kind of discussions since, since BCA was founded, we've seen loads of kind of think tanks and organizations and individuals that historically haven't been very involved in environmental discussions now suddenly kind of start producing papers about it, contribute to the book, have webinars about it, uh, be willing to have these discussions. So, so I think that's, uh, that's just a really good sign that we're moving in the right direction. And it's because we are offering innovation-based real solutions. Now, Zian, I'm kind of interested in your perspective here on, on how I suppose from somebody used to be in rebellion, how they view people who don't necessarily completely subscribe to their worldview. Is it is it a sense in which you're either 100% with us or you're basically as good as a climate skeptic to us? Uh, would they say people talking about free market environmentalism are, are just trying to hide the truth, which is we need 100% renewable energy and they're part of the just as much part of the problem? Or is there more of an openness to, to, to let's say, work together than I might first be expecting? I would say there is a lot of openness. Um, the thing that drew me to Extinction Rebellion was years of working with other environmental groups where it was so tribalistic that you could not have those different views. Whereas in Extinction Rebellion, there were people with, you know, it's quite a broad church. There were academics and scientists with quite strong opinions on things, you know, and there were a lot, there was a lot of internal debate about different things. And, and on the point of that six billion thing, you know, after that happened, there was a lot of upset. The thing you didn't see behind the scenes was people saying, we have to be evidence based. Don't use those numbers. Let's let's come up with numbers so that if you're if you're on screen and you feel pressured, you, you have one to hand, you know, and they, they then create these documents for spokespeople. All those kinds of things happened out of these these mistakes, essentially. So yeah. quite a lot of the people. Um, yeah, subscribe to different views. And that's actually why they have this thing where they're not pro or anti-nuclear. They're not pro or anti anything. You know, they don't believe they should make the decisions because um, by doing that, they can get everybody on board. And that was always their aim. You know, I know that they've become associated as like whatever radical left or whatever, but their aim was really to try and appeal to different groups. And the reason why I founded the newspaper there is because it was completely free of party politics. I just completely kept that out um, as the editor because I wanted to just have something where people can discuss these di different issues and send in their views and just print them. And, and you know, kind of as, as a way of trying to widen the debate away from this, polarization and, and tribalism. Uh, which kind of goes to um, the question of Manuel Butler, Zion, that you've expressed interest in answering. Is there any hope of convincing people on the basis of evidence or is the environmental movement based on tribalism and gut feelings and worries? Um, what I want to say about this is that it's not just the environmental movement. It's just not. Look it's at what is happening humanity, with yeah. masks in the US. Look at what is happening with masks. It's just insane, isn't it? You've, you must have seen what's happening. Um, and, but what I will say is often when there's this real resistance to what might be a positive change or solution, it's, it's fear-based, it's emotions-based. Um, you know, you think with nu nuclear, that's what people think. People talk about waste with nuclear power and they're imagining this goopy green liquid, you know, thanks to the Th Simpsons probably and, and other kind of popular media like that. And that's not, when you talk to them about, well, that's not actually what they are. They're these cylinders and they, you know, and when they're buried, they're very minimal. And when they're buried, they're, they're covered in layers of, of concrete and they're very well protected. And if a plane crashed into them, you know, they, they wouldn't get out. And the same, same thing with nuclear weapons. I say, what if somebody got, got the weapon? Well, I'd say, you know, Britain already has the atomic bomb, but also um, any, you know, technically anybody can get hold of that, that technology anyway. You know, it's, unless you get rid of every nuclear physicist in the world, 
that capability exists to, you know so really um it's about getting people away from the fear and it was the same in the anti-vax movement which is still ongoing that's still a problem in fact i just saw a poll that said uh, that was done in america that found that a third of people wouldn't take a vaccine for covid which has really worried people over there because um the experts are saying well then even if we get a vaccine it won't the uptake won't be high enough for herd immunity if if that's true if really a third of people won't so they need to now look at how do you educate people and get them on board on side but actually again it's it's often fear driven and a lot of the solutions um like you know things like gmos you know i've often talked to people about gmos and this is this is something that a lot of people have come around on where they used to be really anti and they're just not anymore and i found this in extinction rebellion as well a lot of people just willing to hear about things you know and when you talk to them about things like golden rice you know here's here's a rice that potentially um genetically engineering it could could feed lots of children it would stop them going blind because it has added vitamin a to it and the vitamin a deficiencies at the moment are giving them you know uh, then they'd come completely around so so and that shifted over time i remember when there was a time when it was just you know no and now we see this with other things like 5g and I don't really know, I don't really know or understand who's behind that or and what the ideology is, but there there have been, there have been all these lies about 5G technology. There have been people going out and destroying masts around the UK. This is a huge thing that people are really afraid of. And I think actually it happens a lot with new tech or anything that's perceived to be new tech, even though it, you know, something like GMO that's actually not really new. It's farmers have always modified crops. They just it's just now they they use simulations in a lab to do it that's really just the fundamental difference there but once you explain these things to people quite a lot of the time they do come around which is why which is why i've taken up this role because i believe that you know it can make a difference otherwise i just wouldn't bother but you know what a depressing world it would be if it, people didn't ever change their minds and i think part of that part of that with with something like nuclear is about moving away from the tribalism and the you know the ideology based um environmentalism and just 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 actually maybe just forming a new movement just we're here for the evidence-based environmentalism what does the data say and just leave the other stuff behind you know you need a new tribe here's a new tribe it's evidence-based environmentalism and i think there's a lot of hope for that based on the response that i've got from since coming out i would say there's a lot of scope yeah i, I would i would agree with that i would also point out that i think it's generational to an extent i mean the kind of um uh, Earth Day kind of 68 generation that was kind of very um, in tune in nature ideology and instinctively uh, very skeptical of innovation in science. I think that's changing. I mean, polling that we did at the BCA with young people showed that 74% um, of young people are in favor of nuclear in, in the UK here. Um, polling that, that I wrote an article about uh, with the uh, GMOs is that young people are overwhelmingly in favor of GMOs and I think that's that you see this generational shift and you see more and more people kind of uh, willing to look at the science and willing to look at the facts and the evidence um, and and so that's that's just a really positive thing to see uh, and, and so the main the main challenge for us is to translate that public opinion that changing public opinion into effective government policy so one of the one of the things that I'm very excited about with with Brexit, for example, is the UK's ability to move away from the EU's precautionary principle. I mean, there was a comment here. Somebody said the EU effectively banned GMOs because of the precautionary principle. And I think that's something where the UK can change tack. Uh, same with artificial artificial intelligence, with the European Green De uh, Green Deal that Ursula von der Leyen um, is is promoting. They want to effectively regulate artificial intelligence out of existence, whereas artificial intelligence is another thing that will be very helpful in combating climate change. And so I think we need to translate these kind of innovations into um, into effective public policy making to, to make it last as well. And what, what else beyond nuclear are you intending to be working on at Environmental Progress UK? Um, what What is the focus? Is it um, nuclear energy? Are you going to be doing some work on GMOs? What What else? What else is it? What, or is it just kind of a more generalist kind of different approach to the environmental policy that you're focusing on? Different. Areas? Yeah, it's more general, but um, I, you know, I really want to see size well built. I think that if we don't build it now, we will regret it later because you know it will take ten to twelve years. And where is our energy go? Where where is our energy going to come from in that time? It is not going to come from renewables. And I still hear people say there's a battery technology around the corner. When we have that, we can store infinite amounts. You know what? When I joined the environmental movement 15 years ago, that's the same argument. 
I have had to just sit back and go, hang on a minute, that is not going to happen. You know what? Great if it did happen. Great if it did happen. But in the meantime, we can be investing in clean energy right now. And it's not even just, it is about climate change, absolutely. And I talk about climate change a lot, but it's also about air pollution. You know, how many people do you know and how many children are suffering in, 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 in our, you know, in developed countries from these awful, you know, lung afflictions? It's so common now. Look at the, my, my daughter and the children in the class and how many children have an inhaler. I mean, when I was growing up, it was, you know, really unusual. And now it's completely normal. And that's not, it's not right, you know, that, that, that air pollution is coming from just pumping out emissions from fossil fuels that we don't really need. It would be a different thing if we absolutely needed them to continue to live, but we don't. And it's, and it, it's such an absurd thing to me that um, we have a clean energy solution. Imagine if that was invented today. Imagine if nuclear power was discovered today, we would hail it as the most greatest invention and we would embrace it. You know, and that's what a lot of people are waiting for with renewables, but it's just, it's not going to happen. I think that's something that people really just need to let, let die, let die, you know, and it's similar with advanced, even with nuclear, you start to hear it when people start talking about advanced nuclear and that's great fun that, you know, it, incredible things could come out of it, but we can't build it right now. It's not ready to build right now. We have workable models that we know can supply energy. Look at, look at what happened in Germany. They had working operating power plants, no issues. They shut them down. They shut them down because of the anti-nuclear sentiment there. And that is due to things, you know, the Greenpeace group is very active in there, for example, having a lot of influence on people. They shut them down and then they had to start burning more coal. Their emissions went up. That's that's a scary reality to me. That's just that's not right. And um, and what you know, what I think is that we need people on the other side to counter that kind of Greenpeace type anti, you know, <laughs> Um, yeah. anti-evidence space really and so that's that's really my aim it's um public engagement it's helping to shift the conversation have a conversation about it and then help to shift it and get and hopefully see investment in this country because we need it and, and actually we're in such a strong position you know if you think people say 20 billion is expensive but hs2 is costing 80 billion you know no, probably but, 100 you know, probably well over 100 billion look yeah. at what we can do with that that actually yeah. you know how much how is 80 years of energy for 20 billion that is that is a phenomenal amount you know. I mean, and I do find it fascinating that all the focus on climate change, obviously a long-term, very serious issue, takes focus away from what is a more short, immediate issue, which is um, NOx pollutants and the, the classic trade-off when uh, under the Blair government, they started um, creating a tax incentive in the, the car registration system to get low carbon um, vehicles, which meant diesel vehicles, which have actually led to a lot more pollution in cities like London. But even outside London, in the developing world, we've got a, a serious issue where just people don't have... Um, electricity in their homes that means they're burning fuels and the consequence of that is is inevitably that you're going to have more people dying from direct um inhalation because i want to go back to you about a kind of a from a slightly different angle something we were talking about earlier which is um so of course the uk is historically one of the world's largest emitters but today is a relatively minor contributor um half of the world's carbon emissions come from asia uh, a quarter from china alone how do you kind of get climate action that I suppose is is both universal but also fair because in, in some ways we want these countries to have an opportunity to develop to um, as we were talking about earlier with development can, industrialization can come more energy use and that can come more carbon emissions we don't want to prevent them from lifting themselves out of poverty because that's just a more immediate concern to them but at the same time reduce carbon emissions how do we balance those two Chris? Well yeah I think it's, it's a very big issue and, and it's one of the reasons why I find the degrowth narrative so uncompelling is because how is how are us destroying our economy and kind of um, removing our ability to innovate and to have more resources to be able to innovate how is that going to help china and india and and those kinds of countries to move away from uh, fossil fuels themselves and so so the way i see it is that we should first of all be making um countries like the uk countries like america israel kind of hubs of innovation of kind of entrepreneurial activity that creates innovation in GMOs in nuclear in in uh, artificial intelligence and also renewables and then that we share that technology with, with the rest of the world and I think that is really the only way that we can go about this is that we that we um, set up free trade agreements for example um, uh, there's a free, free trade agreement called ACTS, which is the Agreement on Climate Change, Trade and Sustainability, and the idea is to remove all tariff and non-tariff areas to the free trade 
of uh, environmental goods and services. I think that's an excellent proposal because then we can share technology, we can share goods and services across countries and really kind of dissipate the knowledge around the world. Um, and so I think that's, that's a much more effective way at getting India and China the technologies that they need rather than looking at wrecking our own economy. Uh, so did you want to take that up in terms of the more global approach? I mean, I pretty much agree, to be honest. I think actually it's a shame that a lot of countries, developing countries, are having renewables pushed on them. And I'm not an anti-renewable person. I think where it works, that's great. You know, the IPCC recommends it. That's good for me. But the, the, the amount that some of these countries need, the amount of energy is not going to be met. And then by renewables. And then they're left, you know, they're often left with... Um, the, the the waste problem that they, they you know where I mean I've been I've been to India I've traveled around India I've seen the villages there's no infrastructure that infrastructure cannot be built without energy we cannot expect them to um you know to to not develop it's it's really shocking anybody who goes out there it's it's sad and it's shocking I mean my parents migrated here in the 60s they um worked in factories their whole lives you know they were really grateful for the opportunity when I went when I went over there and I saw many many cousins that I've had I've only been over once and I only met them the once and the dire poverty they lived in and I know people know that it's happening but sometimes I think do you realize what you're saying when you say climate change is going to be like this it's going to be really awful and we're going to have to live like this people are already living like that people the world over are already living in what you are calling apocalyptic scenarios they are already living like that what are we going to do to help them to get out of it and putting putting sanctions on them to, or, or um you know misleading them in terms of you know saying nuclear is not a viable option the amount of energy a country like india needs to have to develop and have the infrastructure to deal with them the biggest problems um that that's going to come from nuclear power it's not going to come from renewables there's so many millions of people you're talking about so, such vast quantities of land um, they might have more success with solar than us because it's more, you know, sunnier. But even then, just the investment, as I said, that you'd be putting a ton of money in for a small amount of generation. That same amount of money could go towards nuclear power and have exponential amount of energy, which is really what they need. And they're going to need it more over time because they're already suffering quite a lot with climate change. They're suffering from, you know, more frequent droughts. They're suffering from, um, you know, I saw a UN report that said that 40% of India won't have access to water by 2030. I recommend anybody read that report if they, you know, don't believe me because I couldn't, be I couldn't believe it. It's a really sad thing that these people, their wells will dry up, their crops will dry up, they'll have to move, you know, what's going to happen, where are they going to move to, where are they going to get water from? Well, guess what, you know, desalinization is a great solution. There's always solutions when you look really, really closely, there's always solutions, but that can't happen without an energy source. So really, to me, a lot of it keeps coming back to these places need energy more than anything. We, we've had it, we've, we've, we've now got to this great scenario and we're saying, we don't want to live like that anymore, you know, um, but then at the same time, we're rejecting solutions that those countries need and solutions that we need, ultimately, when it comes to something like nuclear power or you know, GMOs and lo lots of other things. Yeah, what, what baffles me most about that is is just how uncost effective it's been. I mean, it, it's been 20 trillion in subsidies for renewables um, around the world. Uh, and and it still accounts only for about 5% of global energy production. And just about how many nuclear reactors we could have built for that. Exactly. And and, and even that, like how, mu how much food could have been created for people in poverty? How many how many new buildings that are weather resistant could have been built, all those things. It's just, there's no cost benefit analysis whatsoever when it comes to these issues. Um, Cause what's your view on uh, a solution that's talked about there, a carbon tax uh, in the UK that can properly price uh, carbon emissions and potentially incentivize people to limit their, their contribution. Is that a solution that the BCA and, and you'd back? Well, I, so I see a carbon tax as a fair principle. I think within a free market, it's unfair to expect people to uh, shoulder the burden of others polluting indiscriminately on others. Um, and so I think in a free market, to be able to account for what you call negative externalities, which is CO2 in this case, is, is a fair principle. Uh, so I see it as a market-based mechanism. The only thing is that um, you have to carefully consider the way you frame the policy. So for example, um, we'd be interested in, in, in looking into a revenue neutral carbon tax. For example, you either reduce other taxes proportionally, so people don't end up paying more and which would hit the poorest communities in the country, 
or you look at um, at a carbon dividends model where you kind of any money that's raised from a carbon tax gets given back to um, to communities. Uh, but another flip side, which is really important, is that you also have the opportunity to get rid of a lot of environmental regulations, which not only become superfluous, but also become very costly. And, and they add extra kind of regulatory hurdles for uh, businesses, um, which obviously jacks up the cost for them. And so if you want to implement a carbon tax, which would be quite an effective, I mean, most economists agree, it'd be very effective at reducing carbon emissions. You also have to look at it from kind of the economic perspective and how can we do this without again, making prices rise for the poorest communities without putting loads of businesses um, out of business. Um, and, and how can we do this in a way that actually helps us grow the economy at the same time as reduce carbon emissions like they did it in British Columbia very successfully? I think we, we are kind of running out of time, but I know this is quite a technical question about size we'll see and potential biodiversity loss and eroding flood zones. I was wondering if you wanted to make some uh, response to that and maybe make some concluding remarks just in a, in a I actually um I actually contacted the RSPB about this I was really hoping to have a dialogue with them I haven't heard anything back yet after they put out a tweet saying they couldn't support Sizewell because of the biodiversity loss and I basically replied on Twitter saying that is NIMBY thinking that is not in my backyard thinking how much biodiversity loss is going to occur because of climate change these plants have to go somewhere I am a huge nature lover I'm a birder I completely agree with all of the, you know, I, great. I love, I love the environment. I spent my life fighting for this, but these plants have to go somewhere. And actually it is not evidence-based to say that they will decimate the life, wildlife population. It just isn't. Show me a paper that says it and I promise you I will read it, but it needs to be actual data, not something that your friend wrote. You know, that's sometimes that's the sort of stuff I get sent. Um, but I still read it. I will still read it because I want to know what people's arguments are and where they're coming from. In fact, in Florida, um, Crystal, Crystal River, have you heard of that? In Florida, there was a plant there. Um, people objected because um, there's a huge manatee population that migrates there. Again, don't just take my word for this. Look this up. They, they migrate there. People objected because they said it would damage the manatee population. You know what happened? The manatee population increased because the water that came out of the plant, which is completely safe, completely safe water, by the way, um, was warm and it was so warm it attracted more manatees and when they closed the plant the manatee numbers went back down that's a real story I could, if you want a link tweet me zeon tree i'm at zeon tree i will send you a link to to evidence that shows that so it's not even fair or true to say if you show me a paper that says it will decimate this population you know what then maybe we would look at how do we protect that specific population of bird but when i asked the rsbb they didn't have anything specific and they haven't really engaged with it which i think is a real shame because it's nimby thinking what is going to happen to biodiversity all over the world if we don't get our emissions down all climate change is about is getting emissions down that's the solution it's that simple we get the, the, the emissions down, the greenhouse gas emissions can stop rising, the planet, the planet stops heating up exponentially, the species loss declines, it's that simple. If we don't build these because people are worried about the local birds, you know, how many, have you seen the reports for how many birds there will be left in the UK? Have you seen the, the list of the number of birds that will not survive because they cannot adapt? I mean, we really have to look at this in context, but equally, I would still say there isn't evidence, there isn't evidence that all of the, that area will be decimated by a nuclear plant. They're very compact. In fact, if you look, and if you look at wind, and again, I can send you a source for this, the amount of land that um, so, solar panels take up and that wind turbines take up, the amount of lands, I think solar is 500 times more. Um, I can't remember wind, it was wind like 800 times more. Sorry, yeah, okay. Um, it, if you look at that, if you want to talk about biodiversity, those are entire areas being taken over by the, you know, by, and, 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 and if you look at how much energy they're producing, it's just not even comparable. So they're taking a lot of space. They are decimating the wildlife because they're, they're taking up so much of our land and then they're hardly generating any energy. I mean, these arguments- Chris, do you want to just... make some final remarks? We're just hitting, hitting on seven. So we're going to finish up in a second. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, just purely from a geographic perspective, it takes up so much less land which allows for more land to be returned to nature, more forests to be to be planted, things like that. Um, so, so that's the, it's massively in favor of nuclear because it's so compact. Um, and and the other thing is, for example, like like HS2 has that is something that actually has very big um, biodiversity losses because it just goes across the country. Nuclear wouldn't be even comparable to that. Um, so I think I think just it's a matter of people getting their priorities wrong.
um, and, and needing to look at the evidence again. So yeah, that's really, really pretty much my view of that. Well, thank you very much, both of you. I think this was a fantastic discussion. It was good to dive in deep to some of the issues, but also have a bit of discussion about kind of the narrative behind environmentalism and not just from the negative sense, uh, but also a very positive, forward-looking, um, progressive, in the true sense of progressive, which is trying to achieve progress um, that I think we can do. In, and I think these discussions are so important to bring people together who might not traditionally have the same uh, political outlook, but are all trying to achieve the same goals. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.